Amen. Exodus, Exodus chapter 13. Exodus chapter 13. And after, after service, y'all can ask her to remove that glove and see that big old diamond. Exodus chapter 13. Now I'm preaching, y'all know more than me. That's why Israel, it's a good lesson. That's why they was in the wilderness for 100 years. They wouldn't listen to Moses. God know exactly what he's doing. <laughs> now y'all wonder why they stuck. Moses said, go this way. No, go that way. Exodus chapter 13. Uh, chapter 3, uh, verses 17 through 22. And then we're going to read Exodus 14, 1 and 2. Y'all just slow down. Don't take the sermon from me. Just slow down. Verse 17 says, And it came to pass when Pharaoh had let the people go that God led them not through the way of the land of the Philistines, although that was near, for God said, Lest peradventure, which means perhaps the people repent when they see war, they change their mind and they return to Egypt. But God led the people about through the way of the wilderness of the Red Sea. And the children of Israel went up hardness out of the land. They went rank. They went out in number, in groups. And Moses took the bones of Joseph with him, for he had straightly sworn to the children of Israel, saying, God will surely visit you, and ye shall carry up my bones away from hence. And they took their journey from Sukkoth and encamped in Etham in the edge of the wilderness. And the Lord went before them by day in a pillar of a cloud to lead them the way. And by night in a pillar of fire to give them light to go day and night. He took not away the pillar of the cloud by day nor the pillar of fire by night from before the people. And the Lord said unto Moses, Exodus chapter 14, verse 1, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, that they turn and encamp before Pi Haratha, between Migdal and the sea, over against Baal Zaphon, before it ye encamped, ye shall encamp by the sea. The word of God. For just a few moments, my brothers and my sisters in Christ Jesus, our living Lord, I, I want to talk from the subject, if you will, as we start this awesome series that we start today. Uh, the next 10 weeks will be coming, uh, the basis will be coming from a, a book entitled Red Sea Rules. And in that book, it gives us 10 God-given strategies for dealing with difficulties so on today on today red sea new red sea rule number one is realize that God means for you to be where you are red sea rule number one it should be up on the screen it's to realize that God means for you to be where you are you may be in a tight spot you may be in a tighter spot you may be in a bad spot you may be in a depressed spot but wherever you are realize God means for you wherever you are right now he means for you to be there whether it's a troubled marriage a bad job God means for you to be right where you are that's Red Sea rule number one now if you let me tag the text in my own way Reverend Owens I, I want to talk about Sense and nonsense about God's guidance. Red Sea rule number one. You got to realize, Bridget, that God means for you to be where you are. And we'll tag the text, Sister Cummings, and we want to talk about sense and nonsense about God's guidance. The children of Israel had now completed their three-day journey. Now, many of you may not know, and that's why, it's, it, that's why everybody in the world that can ought to go to church, 
and we see the movie and get caught up in some things, many of us don't know, Reverend Owens, that intentionally, originally, the children of Israel was not to leave there. They simply wanted to go to the wilderness and worship for three days and come back. Let me show you. Proof text, Exodus chapter 3, verse 18. Verse 18, Exodus chapter 3, verse 18 says, And they shall hearken to thy voice, and thou shalt come, thou and the elders of Israel, unto the king of Egypt. Ye shall say unto him, The Lord God of the Hebrews hath met with us today. And now let us go, we beseech you, three days' journey into the wilderness, that we may sacrifice to the Lord our God. So originally, all they wanted to do was go have a service. They, they had been enslaved for over 400 years, and they ain't had a church service. So, so, so they said, we want to go three days to the wilderness. We want to have a feast. We want to have a worship experience, and then we will come back and go back to serving. But it's amazing, it's amazing once they went and worshiped God, what they saw. And once they went and worshiped God and saw that there was some hope, it, they, they, they didn't never return. We'll talk about that later. But the point I want to make is that's why some of us are so lost and stuck because you ain't made a worship service. You, 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 you get to the service, you realize there's another land over there. You, you get to the service, you realize God is a healer. You realize God is a deliverer. You realize God will make a way out of no way. You realize God is high and lifted up. Up. God is holy. God is just. God is good. And, and, and some of us never get there because we don't never make it to worship. And you just stay a slave for over 430 years. So according to the text, according to the text, Sean Gibson, the, the time has come. The children of Israel, they, they had completed their three-day journey. And at Etham, the decisive step would have been taken whether they would celebrate their intended feast in return or march onwards by the Red Sea into the desert, a view to the final departure which God, Susan, told Abraham that your folk are going to inherit Canaan, which is the promised land. Andrew, they were already on the borders of the desert, and a, a short march would have placed them, brother and sister Henry, beyond the reach of pursuit because the chariots of Egypt would have had little success against them over the dry and the yielding sand. But, but Eusenia, at Etham, something strange happened. At Ethan Paul Smith, instead of pursuing their journey eastward with the sea on the right, they were suddenly commanded by some strange GPS system to diverge to the south, keeping the gulf on the left. A route would not only detain them lingering on the confines of Egypt, but in adopting it, Brian Phillips, they actually turned their backs on the land which they had set out to obtain the possession. So not only, Bible Williams, was this a strange detour, but this detour led to a delay. And, and Deacon Bonner, not just a delay, it was a daring, dangerous, and deadly delay. Yeah, yeah, this literally made no earthly sense. This, this didn't make sense. This, this was like Thursday night, what we saw at 9 o'clock. This is a joke. This, this decision that the one that was directing the GPS, it seems like, wait a minute, this is illogical. This is irresponsible, and it's impossible. I mean, this is a mysterious movement, a movement so unexpected and of which the ultimate design was carefully concealed could not help but excite the astonishment of all of them and even Moses. I mean, this didn't make sense. My brother's... And my sisters, what, what happens to us when it appears God's guidance 
is not making no sense. And you may not have been courageous enough to say it, but I know y'all, if you ain't said it, you thought it. God done told you to do some things. You said, now what? No, now ain't he supposed to know all things? This is, don't make sense. What, what happens to us when his root, Deborah, sends us back in the direction of the folk we running from? Like, Andrew, this, this God, God, uh, God. What, what happens, Rhonda Henry, to us when it appears that God is not making no kind of sense? Honest folk, honest folk, raise your hand. You ever thought God just, like, slipped one time and didn't know what he was doing? See, thank you, some honest folk. What usually happens to us, Craig, is we start to worry. And notice what I said. What happens when it appears to us he ain't making sense? Most folks start to worry. And worry has been defined as a small trickle of fear that meanders through the mind, cutting a channel into which all other things flow. In other words, you're worrying over here, and now it's affecting you over here. You ain't making sense over here because you're worrying about something over here. So what you're worrying about has nothing to do with him or her, but since you're worrying over here, now when you talk to him and her, now everything is construed, and if that's the right word, and, and everything is foggy because your worry has then went through your system and now you suspect against everybody. Now you're a detective. Now you're paranoid. Now the whole world is against you. They don't even know what you're going through, baby. You still worrying about over here. And over here didn't affect your relationship with over there. Now you don't trust nobody. Looking through the window. The preacher John R. Rice said, worry Delbert is putting question marks where God has put periods. Bishop Filton J. Sheen called worry a form of atheism. He said, because it betrays a lack of faith and trust in God. But for some of us, worry seems as inherent as breathing. And I know, I know, I feel you. I know, I've been around y'all nine years. I can read your foreheads. I know it. I know it. What some of y'all are saying now is, Reverend, how can we not worry when, when our outflow exceeds our income and the credit as our calling? How can I not worry? How can I not worry when I don't have enough month left at the end of my money? And I said it right, not the other way around, because I must run out before our money do. How, how can I not worry, Reverend, when, when my money is funny, my change is strange, and my credit is jacked up? I went to the bank, and my co-signer needed a co-signer. How can I not worry? How can I not worry, Lorene, when my poor financial portfolio, not collapsing, y'all, has done collapsed? How, how can I not worry when my loved one has been diagnosed with cancer? How can I not worry? How can I not worry when, when my employment is terminated and for some that have it how can I not worry when mine might not be terminated but it's terminal how how can you not worry when you go to the hospital and you got mixed up they didn't say they take assurance they take insurance how can you not Worry when the Red Sea faces you, the desert surrounds you, and the soldiers of Egypt are speeding toward you with drawn swords. How can I not worry 
about the economy when I, I turned the TV on Thursday 